Okay, welcome back everybody. So we're going to finish up section 2.3 today. Um, and in fact, really the first subsection of section 2.3 is what our first example will be on and then we'll jump to the Fourier series in multiple dimensions because, you know, the solutions to PDEs will still be scalar fields. So we have to uh, understand the Fourier series in more than one dimension for us to be able to analyze any sort of uh, non-trivial PDEs. But we'll finish up on studying it in one dimension first and then transition. So here's just another really good motivation for studying the, the Fourier series, even in one dimension. And this is going to be sending pictures by instead sending algorithms, right? So this is a version of data compression wherein you can con send actually just a, a collection of numbers as well as, you know, um, an algorithm to combine those numbers. In this case, we're thinking a finite collection of Fourier coefficients as well as the algorithm, which is the reconstruction. And we're going to send that instead of sending a picture. So imagine you have what I've got here, the nice triangle. This, of course, can get much more complicated than the triangle, but we're going to stick with the triangle for now. So imagine that you have a triangle. And the way that this has actually been constructed here is that I've written this in the complex plane. So the vertical axis is the imaginary part of the output of a, of a complex value function. And then the uh, real axis is the real part of the output of a complex function. And so my, my function that I'm plotting here is the following. It looks a lot worse than it is. Every time we see negative one to the two thirds, um, I'm re-representing e to the i pi as negative one, and then that to the two thirds, or you should think about that as e to the i two pi over three. And what is e to the i uh, two pi over three? That's uh, that's the point uh, over here, actually, on the unit circle, and then the other one is the point over here. Uh, but that's just to, to define some of these directions, right? So the directions that these head in align with those vectors in certain situations. Um, so that's what some of these numbers are is these complex valued objects. And then and then uh, if you combine them all together correctly into a piecewise function, you exactly trace out the, the triangle that we have here. So long as you actually plot the real part on the real part of the axis and the imaginary part on the imaginary part of the axis. And of course the idea is as t evolves from minus pi to positive pi, we, we trace ourselves around. We trace ourselves around this. So I think I start with t right there at minus pi. And then at pi over three, we get there. At two pi over three, we come up here. And then at positive pi, we get over here. So actually, so I think you start at negative pi here to negative pi over three here to positive pi over three here, and then back to uh, pi over here. So that's how you trace around the triangle according to this function I've constructed. The whole idea of constructing the function as well as the triangle is, is kind of you know not the point of this exercise, but um, you know if you want to pay attention to the function in the triangle, you can. The point of the exercise is that we all know that we have the ability we have the ability to compute f hat n of this function f of t over the interval. What is the interval that f of t is defined on? It's t going from minus pi to pi. So over the interval minus pi to pi. So this is totally within the realm of possibility for us to do. So we're going to go ahead and compute those f hats or the Fourier transform over this interval. And you just do that with an integral, right? It's the same sort of integration we were doing last round. And we end up with the following f hat of n, where once again, uh, it doesn't look like it, but this function's odd. So an odd function over a symmetric interval is going to give me 0 when n is 0. And for every other n, I just have the nice Fourier transform as I've given it to you there. And so you're just going to start plugging in a lot of these numbers, um, you know, different values of n here. And then you get, you get different, uh, different values for f hat. But what you can do is instead of sending this image, suppose I wanted to send the image to somebody, I could either send the entire image, which is, you know, dot, 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 every pixel in the image that would get really, really annoying. And even so, I could almost honestly also send all of the dots. If I even wanted to do a little bit of data compression, I could just assign each of these as a dot. But I would have to say, I would have to give the X and Y coordinates for every single dot on all of these parts which is a lot of uh, dots, right? I mean, f of t here, t is, there's an uncountably infinite number of t's there. So I'd have to send technically infinitely many dots. Of course, to reproduce the image, it would, I would just choose a finite number of those. But what I could do instead is just send these values of f hat. And let's say, maybe I'm just going to send uh, 11 of these values from 5 to negative 5, including 0. That's a total of 11 values of f hat, as well as the 12th value of saying, actually, we're going to reconstruct this. Uh, we're going to represent this image as a, as a Fourier reconstruction of f hat. And so I'm going to send all those to my friend and he's going to be able to figure out that he can reconstruct it and then plot it and he's going to get the following image. So the following image is not exactly the image we started with, right? The corners have been a little bit rounded, 
but we're pretty darn close after only 11 points of data. And so, you know, you could choose 100 points, 100 is still less than uncountably infinitely many, and after 100 you would get, you would get sharper and sharper corners, and you'd be approaching the actual image pretty quick. And so this is just a nice case uh, of deciding that we can send really a pretty small number of points, depending on what our original image is, and you can do this with any, all sorts of images, I'll actually link to a very nice website that helps visualize this for other images. Um, so you can do this for a vast number of images, uh, as long as you have some sort of function which describes uh, the periodic image, and then compute the Fourier transform, send so many coefficients, and then you can reconstruct it as close or as uh, not close as you would like. This is just one example of a data compression algorithm, and then we're going to move on actually to kind of the whole point of this chapter, which is the, uh, the Fourier series in multiple dimensions. So all we're going to do here is we're going to extend the, the Fourier series in one dimension, right? This is like e to the i x. We're going to extend it to, to uh, d dimensions just by putting ourselves into a vector. So here, this is my shorthand for the vector, call it z or e to the i x vector, even though it doesn't make sense to exponentiate a vector like that. Uh, but what I mean by that is, you know, by definition, e to the i x1, e to the i x2, dot, 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 e to the i x d, as, as now I just, I'm allowing myself to uh, evolve in d different directions of the complex unit circle, as well as the negative ones, right? The negative directions. Um, so I've got a little bit of dis description about really what, what's going on behind the scenes of a, of a Fourier series when you're constructing them is that you have um, what's called the basis decomposition of a vector. If you've taken linear algebra, this is probably a fairly important topic where you have an orthonormal basis with respect to an inner product that somebody has given you. And you can represent any vector in the span of the orthonormal basis as the collection of coefficients given by the inner product of your vector against an element of the orthonormal basis. So because the inner product is a scalar product, the coefficients are individually scalars, and they all individually depend on whichever basis element you're evaluating at. And then you finally finish up by taking the sum of everything. So this is actually the case with the Fourier series. As long as you define your inner product of a function against a complex exponential as exactly the Fourier series transform that we encountered in the last video. So as long as you define your inner product against the basis elements as the Fourier series transform, and, and we could explain, we could go in deeper as to why this is a perfectly valid inner product, uh, perhaps another time, but if you define this as your inner product, really, okay, there's, this is f hat, right? We've got f hat of n. We've got f on the left-hand side here. We're reconstructing it over all n's. Where are my orthonormal basis? These are the complex exponentials, e to the i n x. So that's the idea the Fourier series is that is that we've kind of extracted an orthonormal basis of functions with respect to this very specific inner product given by an integral and then you actually are just recreating a basis decomposition theorem. So we're going to try to do the same thing for higher dimensions. We're going to try to identify an orthonormal basis as well as a natural inner product on scalar fields and then we're just going to give ourselves the ability to calculate phi hat, you know, the, the Fourier series transform of phi um, as the inner product of phi against psi, which was, you know, my orthonormal basis elements. So, and then you can reconstruct against those. So we're going to try to do something very similar in D dimensions. So the tricky thing though, becomes from this inner product was pretty easy to define in one dimension. We just go against dx. In higher dimensions, the inner product, we have to go against dv. So jumping way back to calculus 3 or whatever multivariable calculus you had, dv, when I write it like that, and the variable of integration is an x, this is defined as dx1, dx2, dot, 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 dx, uh, d. It's called the volume form of x. And you'll also see me write it sometimes as dv of uh, the variable x. So anytime you see a capital V next to a D, think about it as the volume form. It's the, it's the uh, product measure of all of the differentials uh, in, in every direction of the vector space. So, so that's going to be, that's going to be DV if you see it. And the tricky thing is, is that um, the inner product now will depend on omega, which jumping back to, you know, I guess section 1.2 in this book, you all learned that omega can take on many different shapes. 
and things get really tricky when Omega takes on some tricky shapes. So in fact, we will restrict defining our inner product. The, the whole idea of a Fourier series in higher dimensions is perfectly well defined as I've described it here with one, two, and three. And this is like the right way to think about things. We're going to get to it a little deeper when we get to the spectral method of solving ODEs. Um, but we just, we can't, we can't introduce it right now uh, because of Omega because of this idea that omega, everything is so dependent when I form this inner product on the shape of omega, that we're gonna have to be uh, learn a little bit more about everything before we get too much into it. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna choose the sim one of the simplest and perhaps the simplest omega as a subset of d-dimensional space. So if I, wanted, if I wanna be in d-dimensions, we're gonna let omega be the hypercube of uh, side length two pi centered at the origin. Okay, so this is just going to be a d-dimensional cube. Every side length has two pi. It's gonna be centered at the origin. This is gonna be the simplest omega we can possibly come up with so that now when I'm computing my integrals against dv, I get something that even vaguely resembles my one-dimensional Fourier transform. Because the problem is if I change omega, the you just don't resemble the, the one-dimensional Fourier transform at all. So we, we're going to fix ourselves to that very specific omega. That's going to let us find a very easy choice of these bases so that we can define a higher dimensional Fourier transform very easily. And it's actually going to mimic uh, the exact one that we, we, we saw in one dimension. So here it is. I've got it again as a theorem. And the way that this works is we're still just going to be square integrable. My phi that I'm going to try to try to write a Fourier transform of is going to be square integrable, which looks the exact same. I'm just going to be able to square it, but now I have to be careful because, okay, I need to have, this is the, the d-dimensional integral of phi squared, right? So I just have to be careful that when I'm verifying this is square integrable, it has to be square integrable over the full volume in d-dimensions over my full omega, which is minus pi to minus pi to the d power. As long as that exists and it's finite, then I'm still going to be able to use a Fourier series. And the way I'm going to define it, thankfully, looks exactly the same as I did before, except we have to be just like a little bit careful in the fact that now my powers in the exponential have the the n is now going to be a vector. That's why it's boldface. It's going to be a, a dot product with the input x. So for every x in omega, I have an n in the d-dimensional integers, and I'll explain what those look like in a bit. But for every x and omega, I'm summing over all n's in the d-dimensional integers. And within the sum, I'm computing the dot product of the vector n and the vector x, and that's what goes into the power of e. And then I have this phi hat, which depends on every n in these d-dimensional integers. And uh, that looks the same as before as well. I'm just gonna compute the integral over omega I'm going to compute it with respect to the volume measure. Um, and then I'm going to have now mapping from positive i to negative i in the definition for phi hat. And I'm still going to normalize. It's an integral of normalized volume, right? So if, if I just integrated this over 1, this, this would normalize to, to 1. Um, so everything kind of looks the same. The big difference is that n is now in. This should be phi hat, and that should be zd. So n is now in zd, and I'm taking a dot product of these n's in zd with x. So maybe I'll just describe this a little bit, is we're going to be able to reconstruct var phi from its Fourier transform, summing over all n, which are vectors, in zd, which are the d-dimensional integers, where e to the i n dot x is e to the i n1 x1 plus i n2 x2 plus i dot 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 plus i n d x d. So there's d elements in each n and there's d elements in each x, but all of the n's are integer valued. Let's be a little bit more explicit about those integers n as a vector will just be n1, n2, nd, with each one of these an integer. 
And recall the integers are just the numbers from minus infinity to plus infinity that are the whole numbers, right? So this is dot, 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 negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. So it's all vectors of that form is what I sum over. And you may ask me, is that even possible to sum over that? The answer is yes, you can certainly sum over it because you just start with the vector of all zeros. And then e to the zero power is one. You then start with all vectors which are allowed to have zeros or one in them. So you have something like phi hat of zero one, e to the i x two, we have phi hat uh, one zero, e to the i x one, phi hat, 1, 1, e to the i, x1 plus x2. And then you repeat all zeros, ones, and twos. And then you repeat all zeros, ones, twos, and threes, and so on, and allow that as a sum to converge. So that's going to be the d-dimensional Fourier transform. It's really not any more complicated aside from the fact that we're just going to be computing higher dimensional integrals. And we have to keep in mind that we're doing a dot product. Oh, and then I describe everything along with the notation in the, in the proof. This notation here, the double square bracket, that's just saying that I'm taking integers in that closed interval rather than all real numbers in the closed interval. And I go through the proof. I don't think anybody needs to see why the proof is true. It's basically that it just reduces down to a series of one dimensional Fourier transforms in every single direction that you care about. Um, but what I'm gonna get to then is, is actually an example of computing this. Uh, because the computation isn't as bad as you might think. So let's look at a computation of the two-dimensional Fourier series transform over uh, the interval negative pi to negative pi or positive pi squared. And the function we're looking at is going to be one plus xy. So let's try to find the two-dimensional Fourier transform of one plus xy. We're just going to follow its definition. Right? The definition of the, of the two-dimensional transform is one divided by two pi to the d power. D is two in this case. I'm going to integrate over the interval in two dimensions. Now you can think about every integral. When I write an integral sign in a higher dimensional subscript, this is really the integral from minus pi to pi, integral minus pi to pi. I'm just not being too worried about which x comes first or which y comes first in either of the two of them. So I'm just saying you integrate over the whole set, negative pi to pi squared. It doesn't matter if x goes first or y goes first as long as everything's continuous. Okay, and then I grab my function that I would like to find the transform of, and I put it in. And then what happened here? What's going on with my powers here? Well, e to the i, let's think about it, e to the i n vector dot x vector. Well, x in two dimensions is actually the vector x, y. It's the two dimensional x vector. And I'm just gonna give n the name, two dimensional n vector name, n m. You can choose whatever you want for that name. You could call it n1, n2. You could call it qp if you want. I'm not too worried about it. You just give it a name for each of its dimensions. I'm giving it the name nm. And then if I go ahead and compute this dot product, what do I get? I get e to the i, compute the dot product, I have n times x plus m times y. Okay, so this really is the dot product that my definition includes. And at this point, all I have to do is actually compute. Now we just compute. a two-dimensional integral. So we're just going back to calculus three when you all learned how to compute two-dimensional integrals. And the way that I see it is I want to split my integral up at this plus sign. So I go ahead and split it up at the plus sign. And there's my plus sign that I split it up at. So basically I'm distributing this exponential to both terms and integrating each of them separately. So now I've got this as one integral and this one with the X and the Y on it because those are nice and tricky like we used to always get used to. So I've got an X and a Y on it. Uh, on the trickier one, that's where I'll have to use integration by parts unless I get clever. Uh, the other term is just the integral against one. And if I go ahead and think clever, let's be clever about exponential rules. I can recall e to the i n x plus m y is actually e to the i n x times e to the i m y. And then if I have a product of dx and dy, here's a product of a function only of x, only of y. I can actually rewrite that as two separate integrals. The first one, an integral in x. The second one, an integral in y. I can play the same game here because that's a product of functions. Because of exponential rules, that's a product of functions. I'm going to call this only an integral in x times only an integral in y. And now if we're clever, 
This is actually a Fourier transform only in the variable x. This is a Fourier transform only in the variable y. This is a Fourier transform only in the variable x. This is a Fourier transform only in the variable y. So we've reduced our problem to actually just computing four individual Fourier transforms in the variables x and y. So these Fourier transforms, this is the Fourier transform of the, the constant function one, so I'm calling that one hat. Fourier transform of the constant function one, I'm calling it one hat. Fourier transform of the, of the function x, so I'm calling that x hat. Fourier transform of the function y, so I'm calling that y hat. And so as long as I know each of those Fourier transforms individually, these are all one-dimensional Fourier transforms like we covered in the last video, if I know each of them separately, then I can just combine them into the overall Fourier transform for phi. So let's just find them separately. They're really easy to find, actually. So I've just computed them here. Uh, one hat is just going to be 1 when n is 0 and 0 everywhere else. Same with 1 hat for m. And then the x's and the y's we actually covered because of that uh, the Riemann zeta function properties that I covered last video as well. So we know what both of those equal for the, the variables n and m respectively. So I'm just going to plug each of these in and then be careful about case counting because I'm multiplying terms which are all piecewise. So I'll count up the cases correctly. And when I count up the cases correctly, these can differ when n and m are both 0, when either of them is equal to 0, or when they're both non-zero. So I guess non-zero at the top and both 0 at the bottom. Um, so there's really four different cases here because there's a yes no question in four different cases and so the one case where they're turned on completely turned on is when they're both non-zero and we get the nice product of the x and the y terms here at the bottom right if i took a product here and a product here just don't forget that i squared is negative one negative one to the n i over n times negative one to the m i over m because i squared is negative one this just gives me negative negative 1 to the n plus m, 1 divided by n m, and if I want to absorb the negative 1 out front into the power of negative 1, I can and call it a plus 1 on the power. So that's where that you know most non-trivial term came from here. Otherwise, I'm multiplying a lot of terms by 0, so then I get a lot of zeros, or in the one event that I'm multiplying this one and that one together, I get a 1. So those are all of my possible cases if I do some case counting. And then I will create a reconstruction of this the same way I did with the Fourier series in one dimension. So what does this reconstruction actually look like? It's n vector in z2 phi hat n vector against e to the i x vector dot n vector. But let's make that a little bit more clear. This is actually the sum over all n's and m's going from minus infinity to plus infinity phi hat of n and m e to the i x n plus i y m. So this is what the reconstruction looks like. And if I'm plotting it, when I say I plot an approximation, here I've gone m from negative 20 to 20 and n from negative 20 to 20. So instead of me putting some minus infinity and plus infinities here, what I'm actually doing is minus 20 to 20, and then I went ahead and coded that up and reproduced this image. And what you can see is actually, this looks like a really poor approximation. A lot of you are probably looking at it and saying, I don't want this to be my approximation to one plus x, y, which is the nice smooth surface you can see in there. But in fact, it is actually a good approximation. We just have to be clever about where we're viewing the approximation. If I restrict the approximation just to these parts here, you can start to see that it's actually good approx in this area. There's a good approximation right in the middle. What do you suppose that, that middle area is? If I project everything down, I'm sure you have a pretty good guess about what this area is that we project down to. This is a good approximation over the square minus pi to pi squared. So this length is two pi this length is 2 pi. And then we in fact recover the Gibbs phenomenon and periodicity, but in two dimensions. So that Gibbs phenomenon and periodicity that we witnessed in the last Fourier transform video repeats itself in higher dimensions. And it's just that periodicity in two dimensions looks kind of ugly. If I made this really big, it'd look like a checkerboard, right? Every single square of my two dimensions would get tiled by this repeating structure, the repeating structure uh, that you see in the middle there. So that's what's going on. We do actually have a good reconstruction in the center, but then the Gibbs phenomenon and periodicity gets rid of those approximations elsewhere. 
So I'm gonna provide one more case of motivation here. And the reason why there's a lot of space here is because of the beautiful picture I've got for you now. So the, the other nice motivation of the higher dimensional Fourier transform is gonna be an image denoising. So image denoising, what do I mean by this? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with a function, x plus y divided by two, and I'm gonna plot this on a color map. What do I mean by color map? I mean that depending on the, the value, depending on the value that phi gives me, Depending on this value, I assign a color to the point x, y. So I've got my x, y plane, and I'm going to assign a color to the point x, y, depending on the value of x plus y divided by 2. And we, we end up with the beautiful gradient that I have here. And it's got a lot of nice colors on it. But what I can do is I can pretend like somebody gave me a noisy image instead. So I'm going to call this one phi noisy and put a little uh, xi. This is the Greek variable xi, by the way. It's really fun to pronounce xi. Um, so that's a Greek variable xi, and that's a common variable for white noise. So I'm going to add white noise at every single point x and y in this image. And what you can see is that I have a much worse image. But you could imagine from the beginning, suppose somebody came around, they came around the corner and handed me this image and said, hey, something got corrupted. I'm not too happy with my image. It shouldn't look like that. There's, there's a lot of noise there. Can you get rid of it for me? I would say yes. What I can do to get rid of this noise is take a Fourier transform. If you take a Fourier transform of this image, and you can do this with the image alone. So all I need is somebody to give me the image. And you can take the Fourier transform of the image itself. Now, of course, Mathematically, it still gets represented as the original image plus some noise. But if I were to only analyze the image itself, in fact, you take the Fourier transform and you recover a bunch of coefficients. Now, I've represented these as a matrix. What do I mean by getting these coefficients in a matrix? I mean that these coefficients are um, within the matrix. We have uh, the width is going to be, I believe, n and the height is m, or those might be swapped around. But one way or the other, this is going to be n equals 0, m equals uh, negative 3, n equals 0, m equals negative 2, and then this is n equals 0, m equals negative 1. Both are 0, n equals 0, m equals 1, and so on. So those describe the n, m coordinates. So I'm able to reconstruct my function just by grabbing these numbers and multiplying them by the correct exponentials, obviously with a plus sign instead of a minus sign on them, and then adding them all together. If I do that with all the numbers here and add them all together, I get a, a reconstruction of phi, okay? So I'm reconstructing phi from phi noisy, if I, phi noisy hat, right? So I'm taking a, a Fourier transform of this image. I'm getting a bunch of numbers. The image gives me numbers themselves. The numbers look like this. I'm calling that phi noisy hat, and then I'm gonna construct phi from phi noisy hat. And I'm going to say it's approximately everything that I just discovered by taking a Fourier transform of phi noisy. And when I do that and I re-describe the image, it looks like this. So we went from a really, really pixely image where you can barely even tell if there's a gradient. And we take a Fourier transform. And the important thing is that we've only taken finitely many. So there's only finitely many terms here. And by only taking finitely many terms of our Fourier transform and then reconstructing the image, it's not perfect, right? I think it's very clear that this is not a perfect reconstruction, but we get a lot better. You can definitely tell that the gradient has occurred between the bottom left and the top right. There's a, there's a massive amount of a gradient difference now under the denoising. So this is how Fourier transform denoising works. You just get a noisy image, you take the transform, you only reproduce finitely many terms, and you get something a lot smoother that actually mimics the original image a lot better. And then my final section is on the Fourier series and differential equations. So we want to start to talk about why are these actually important for our course. In our course, we care about how does this Fourier series interact with the derivative. The derivative and differential equations are, are what we care about for the Fourier series. And it's actually quite nice how it, how it interacts with it. And that's that the Fourier series actually diagonalizes the derivative for us. In the sense of if you've taken linear algebra, recall matrix diagonalization gave you the ability to find m inverse really easily. Because what could you do to find m inverse? You could just take the inverse of the diagonal matrix. This is really important. m inverse as a matrix was just the inverse of the diagonal matrix. Since a diagonal matrix is quickly invertible, you just take one divided by the diagonal entries. You actually can quickly invert a matrix. Um, similarly, from chapter one, y'all were seeing how we would take a matrix exponential as 
the exponential of the diagonal matrix and that made your life a lot easier so rather than having to to perform some infinite series for the matrix exponential all you had to do was take the exponential of diagonal entries of the matrix and now the fourier series is special is instead of m instead of m right here this is actually partial uh we'll say actually yeah we'll call it partial xj partial okay and then here you get partial xj and then here you get partial xj and so you can perform these actions of inverting what's happening i'm inverting a derivative i'm taking the exponential of a derivative because the fourier series has diagonalized it for me so that's what the fourier series is important for and what do i actually mean by this the following proposition is what i mean by this if i'm given a fourier series so this is the function that i've reconstructed by its fourier series right it's just by definition what the Fourier series looks like. I can actually compute, I can compute the kth derivative in xj, in the direction of xj, just by computing the kth power of i, the imaginary number, nj to the kth power. I'll really just i nj. So I look at this, this index j, and that's the same index in n that I care about. So if I wanted the derivative with respect to x2, it would be i n2 to the kth power. I immediately recover the kth derivative of my function. So instead of doing a bunch of chain rules, instead of doing a bunch of product rules, quotient rules, etc., if I can represent my function as a Fourier series, then I can compute the kth derivative very, very easily by just computing k powers of, the, of these special coefficients. The same generalizes to the gradient. So if I'm thinking about outer products of vectors, so if I take the kth outer product with the gradient, I can actually do the kth outer product of the vector n, i n. And so this is what I mean by diagonalization. It's not too, it doesn't seem too important what's happening with these ideas, but what does seem important is the next few examples. This is really, we're going to see where all the meat and bones is in these examples. So the first example is easy computation of derivatives. Let's try to take the fourth partial derivative in x and the third partial derivative in y of this function, x, y, cos x, sin y. It is not going to be easy to just do something like uh, partial x to the fourth, partial y cubed. You all would be doing product rules for days if I asked you to do that. So what you can do instead of doing product rules for days is take the Fourier transform of these functions, which, you know, it's not pretty. It's, it's not the world's prettiest Fourier transform, but once you've been given it, you have it. And now that you have it, all you have to do to compute the fourth derivative in x, the third derivative in y, is do four powers of n, three powers of m. Uh, technically, you should have powers of i considered as well, but I've simplified four powers of i and three powers of i to negative i. And so you can actually compute the fourth power of x and the third power of y really easily, as long as your, your function is represented as a Fourier series, just as taking your four powers of m and your four powers, or your four powers of n and your three powers of m. So your life got way, way easier just by knowing the Fourier series. And we can actually expand this to, to PDEs, okay? So this is really the reason why we're including this. And we're going to get into doing this, uh, you know, for real problems in, in Chapter 4. So for now, we're not going to think about these too hard with these examples. But I would like to motivate why are we doing the Fourier series overall. And it's because here's a nice collection of partial derivatives on psi. And I want those partial derivatives and psi all together to add to my x, y, cos x, sine y. And what I could do maybe to think about how do these derivatives behave is I could factor them out to the left. Factor out derivatives, partial derivatives. Okay, so I've factored out my partial derivatives to the left. And then maybe what do I wanna do? I wanna say that the solution to this, if I can factor them out to the left, what does it mean to quote unquote divide by derivatives? It doesn't make any sense to actually divide by derivatives, but we have this symbol still, right? The inverse symbol says we have uh, some object which undoes a derivative. So we have some object which undoes a collection of these derivatives. What is that object? Well, in Fourier space, we can literally divide by the derivatives. This is me literally dividing by those derivatives. So in regular space, in the true real, you know, compute derivative space, we cannot divide. There's no such thing as dividing by derivatives. And yet in Fourier space, because in Fourier space, they're not derivatives, they're numbers. In Fourier space, the derivatives are actually numbers. We can truly divide by them. So this is this is what saves our, us all the time in PEEs is that in Fourier space, derivatives are actually numbers. 
And rather than dividing by derivatives, which is a meaningless, uh, meaningless proposition, we can divide by numbers, which has meaning. And so in Fourier space, dividing by numbers is what solves all of our differential equation problems. Got another one here. I'm probably not going to go over it too much. If we want to solve an initial value problem instead of uh, just a different kind of PDE, you know, jumping back to ODEs, you would solve initial value problems with your matrix exponential. What does it mean to do a derivative exponential instead of a matrix exponential? Well, derivatives, once again, aren't numbers until you consider yourself in a Fourier series. And then all of a sudden, because derivatives are numbers, e to the t derivative makes sense. They're no longer numbers, or they're no longer derivatives, they're now numbers, and e to the t derivatives makes sense in Fourier space. So that's what it means to diagonalize a derivative, is to really represent derivatives as numbers, and then you can perform a lot of really natural mathematical operations with derivatives that you, that you would have loved to perform anyways to solve your equations. So that's all I've got for you today. I know it's been a bit of a long one. Um, we'll practice on this in class a lot. See you later. Bye.